The title of this presentation I chose, Image of God or Planet of Apes, in particular because that shows clearly the contrast between a biblical creation view and an evolutionary view. Because either man is created by God in his image or evolved over millions of years from pond scum through ape-like ancestors. Now, I don't know if you saw the Planet of the Apes movie, at least the more recent rendition of it, but it was very disturbing to me in a number of respects, in particular the way I saw the animals treat the human beings. One point they pick up a little girl to have for a pet, keep her in a cage. It's very distressing to watch. But I taught a research ethics section at a state university. These were PhD candidates, PhD students, and uh, medical doctors in this class. And one of the things I talked about with them was the difference between humans and animals and how they're used in research. And one of the students who was coming from an evolutionary viewpoint talked to me about this. She said, you know, I'd like to say that humans should be treated differently, but I don't have a basis or a framework for why they should. See, the evolution model predicts a common ancestor of man and chimpanzees, man and all of the apes. So if we were to trace our ancestry back, or great, 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 so on, great grandparents, eventually we would find that apes had that same ancestor. And we could go back further and pick up pigs and horses and dogs and plants and fungi, everything else. But well, a creation orchard gives a different type of picture. So instead of all living things coming to the same common ancestor point, each of the different kinds are on a separate tree. So we have man on his own tree and apes on a different tree, perhaps several trees. I chose this Time Magazine issue in particular because of this cover. See, evolutionists often will play uh, semantic games when they're um, uh, approached by a creationist. A creationist says, well, I don't believe humans came from apes. And the evolutionist says, well, we don't either. We believe humans and apes shared a common ancestor. As if that makes a difference, because what is that ancestor going to be like but an ape? But in common understanding, that's what people perceive. So the choice of the title, How Apes Became Human on Time Magazine, indicates what they're really um, after. But in scripture we see there's only one race, the human race. Adam named his wife Eve because she would become the mother of all the living. And of course, Adam being the father of all of the living. Adam and Eve had a number of children. And at a later point we have Noah and a severe population bottleneck where there was a loss of much of the genetic diversity that was present at that time. So only the genotypes that Noah and his sons and their wives had are what persists uh, in the population today. We had a second uh, event that was creating many different population bottlenecks, the dispersion of Babel, where different groups of people went and took with them their genetic diversity and became isolated. But we all go back to one man, Adam, as a real person. 
Paul emphasizes this in Romans. Consequently, just as the result of one trespass was condemnation for all men, so also the result of one act of righteousness was justification that brings life for all men. For just as through the disobedience of the one man the many were made sinners, so also through the obedience of the one man the many will be made righteous. So Paul clearly contrasts the one man, Adam, with the one Christ. But if we're all coming from one man, how do we have different skin colors, for example? We have, there are racial distinctives, what we call racial distinctives. It's very interesting. If you look at the distribution of uh, skin color and compare that to the distribution of UV intensity, there's a very close relationship. In the top uh, image of the world, the darker the color means more intense UV. And then this bottom map shows the skin reflectance, skin color. So closer to the equator where there's more intense UV, there's dark skin. Someone asked me once, well, what about the Eskimos? They tend to have dark skin, and yet they're way up near the North Pole. But Eskimos eat a lot of fish oil in their diet, and fish oil contains vitamin D. Vitamin D is one of the important factors to consider in terms of skin color. We need UV light in order to produce vitamin D, but the competing factor is UV damages folic acid, which is required for DNA replication and during development. It's very important for pregnant women to have enough folic acid for development of their baby. I saw this picture and it was very intriguing because here we see a very dark-skinned person with very narrow eyes, which we typically associate with the Asian individuals. What this shows is how af after Babel, when people, the various people groups spread out, they took with them the specific variations and combinations of genes. And many of those combinations may well have uh, been eliminated. We have had a lot of uh, ethnic fighting and so forth over the course of human history. And so many of these combinations may well have been lost. The Tower of Babel was a very important event in human history. When I was in graduate school, one of my good friends was from China. And she had come to America, and after she was here for a few years, she became a Christian. And one day at lunch, she was so excited, and she said, David, I've never understood why the Chinese character for ship, large boat, was comprised of these individual characters that represented eight people in a vessel, eight mouths technically. She said that eight people in a boat, this isn't large. But she said, I read Genesis last night, I read about Noah's Ark, and there was Noah, his wife, three sons, and their three wives, that's eight people on a really big boat. So this now makes sense to me. Now what this shows is the ancient Chinese people had the knowledge of God.